you know, something that I really like is woodworking. If you know me, you know that making things out of wood just really lights my fire. Got the cabinet over there that I made. I made this. I made the table upstairs that the sound system sits on. I mean, you know, if I've ever had a burning passion, woodworking is it. And isn't it interesting how heat has been used in our language to describe those things that we really like to do? Things that we don't like, you know, we're cold to them. But we warm up to those things that we like. So let me ask us a question this morning. As a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, what is your burning passion? John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So our burning desire ought to be to express Christ's love to others. Amen? Paul describes this love in our passage that we're basing this message upon, beginning here in verse 9. Romans chapter 12. He says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Father God, your word is so direct and, and so clear. Father, it cuts us to the quick because we recognize often there are things in these very words of Paul that we do not accomplish, that we actually shun away from and resist. We're cold to, to them, Lord, instead of warm, instead of hot like we ought to be. Lord, change our mind, alter our wills to be equal with yours, Lord, the same as yours. Help us, Father, to desire your way to be supreme in our lives. Lord, help that love that we're to have be a blazing love that's on fire because of all that you've done for us. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in these first passages here in Romans 12, Paul is describing the kind of love that we ought to have towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should have a blazing love for our fellow Christians. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Genuine, sincere love. Sincere love. What a powerful thing. Pretended love is pretty despicable, isn't it? Someone is to pretend that they love you. True love, unfortunately, is scarce. It's always in danger of substitutes. There's nothing more sickening than a substitute love. I'm reminded of the kindergarten teacher who returned to her class after being absent for a day or so, and she asked the children how they liked their substitute. One little boy said, well, she was all right, but she wasn't as smart as you. She had to use two hands to play the piano. <laughs> Substitutes are never adequate. 
Next, Paul writes, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. It pictures evil as a bad woman to be shunned and good as a woman to which we should cling as though she were our mother or our wife. Paul uses this word here, cling or hold fast. It's a term that's used for sexual relations. Next, he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be devoted, or our love, this is from a combination of words for mother love and brother love. Love among members of God's family should be warm, it should be tender, it should be affectionate. The song says, they'll know we are Christians by our love. love. Okay, I thought we have forgotten. Our love ought to be different, unique, amen? But is it? Next he says, give preference to one another in honor. Paul explains what he means, means here best, I think, in Philippians 2, 3, where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as what? more important than yourselves. True love generates this very unselfish spirit. A man named Max Beerbaum wrote a story entitled The Happy Hypocrite. Title sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? The Happy Hypocrite. It's about a man whose face just personified evil. The man was faced with a dilemma the woman he loved refused to marry him because he didn't look saintly. To solve the problem, he put a mask with a kind face on to cover his evil-looking face, and the young woman married him despite the face underneath the mask. She immediately became glad that she did because her husband proved to be a very attentive, a very unselfish husband. But one day in a moment of rage, an empty and an enemy, rather, abruptly tore off her husband's mask before his wife's eyes. But instead of a cruel, grotesque face, the man had become what he had lived for many years. A good, kind man. Kindness, not evil, now radiated from his face. The Bible urges us in 1 John 3, 2, keep the faith because someday we will look like Jesus. One day we will look like Him in whom we believe. We're, we're being made into the image of Christ day by day as we work together. Next, Paul says that we're to be not lagging behind in diligence. In other words, not slothful, not lazy, not half-hearted. picture is, is that of a flag that's lost the wind and is drooping. It's slothful, it's lazy, just laying there. Rather, we're to be fervent in spirit. We're to be, in other words, enthusiastic. One translation puts it this way, maintain the spiritual glow. Another translation says, be a glow with the spirit. You can be, but it takes commitment. It takes effort. The next phrase is serving the Lord. We're to serve according to those last two phrases there that we talked about, not lagging behind in diligence and fervent in spirit. We're to serve the Lord with that enthusiastic, glowing spirit. The song says, serve the Lord with Gladness in our works and ways. In other words, as we're doing life, we're supposed to serve in gladness. Too much Christianity looks like a hickory log on fire, but a closer examination re reveals that it's really just one of those fake ones, one of those substitutes that has a small light bulb inside. It only looks like it's a log on fire. We need the real thing in our service to God. We need real fire. We need real zeal and actual enthusiasm. And then it will be easy to do these next things. He says, 
rejoicing in hope, the hope of our salvation. You know, English kind of ruins the word hope, uh, the, the Greek word that this comes from. It's a sure hope. It's a certain hope. It's not a hope, you know, I hope so, but probably not. It's, it's a certain hope that this is going to be. Cheerfulness in reality of our certain, sure Christian hope. Persevering, it says, in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. This kind of hope will inspire endurance and tribulation and devotion to prayer. If we're lagging in prayer, then we probably don't have that kind of hope. <laughs> Contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Practice generosity, practice hospitality every day. And unfortunately, well, maybe it's fortunate. You're going to have to go out of your way to practice hospitality often. Christians ought to make loving others dominant in their relationships. But the question is, do we? Do we really? First point of the prescription for revival is to get thoroughly right with God yourself. And that means get all the sin out that separates us from God and from our fellow man. We have to love each other genuinely for that to truly happen. And that's what Paul is saying here. He goes on to describe the love that we should have for those who don't know Christ like we do. We should have a blazing love for the lost, not only for those who are saved. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now the word you in this verse isn't in a lot of the manuscripts. Bless the persecutors, whether they persecute you or somebody else. This, this phrase kind of echoes Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I'm reminded of, of Jesus on the cross as well. He said, Father, forgive them. You know? For they know not what they do. He, he, he further says to rejoice with those who rejoice. To weep with those who weep. Share both the joys and the sorrows. You know, it takes a certain amount of love to be able to sit down with somebody and cry with them when they're in tears because of what's happened. Oh, it's easy to laugh with somebody when something good happens, but it takes a, a, a strong love to sit and cry. Both reveal our interest, reveals the Spirit of Christ within us. But what happens if you're really happy and then someone who's depressed talks to you, or vice versa? Who, who gets influenced, you know? Does another person's attitude rub off on you often? You know, they, you've been having a pretty good day and somebody walks in there having a bad day and now you're having a bad day with them? Should it be the other way around if we're the believer? Shouldn't we be the one rubbing off on them? You know, your attitude can rub off on someone else, right? If it's a genuine attitude that, that comes from God. The question is, what kind of person do you want to be? Some, someone constantly being influenced by the attitudes of others or someone who influences others' attitudes? I love walking you know, either down the street or, or maybe walking in the mall sometime, you encounter people and just intentionally smile at people. It's kind of interesting. Some people, you just, you're not going to affect them. You know, they're just, their frown even gets worse somehow. But a lot of people, you smile at them, they'll smile right back at you. You know, you may have noticed them walking at you and they're, you know, just obviously the hectic, what's going on in their life is getting to them. But you smile at them, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, it, you know, I'm having a good time. You, you need to be that kind of person who influences others. Do you want to make, make everybody you meet depressed? Or do you want to influence them to be happy? I like to think we always want to help them to be happy and joyful and to know the truth of God. It's only when we care about others you know, really feel with people who are suffering uh, and, 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 you know, when they
they see that in us, that we care enough to stop and find out what's going on and, and to help them to overcome their day, then our credibility will be received as authentic when we actually engage with people that help them in the trials that they're facing. Charles Stanley tells the story of a farmer who had some puppies that he needed to sell, painted a sign advertising the pups and set about nailing, you know, went up to nail them the sign to a post on the edge of his yard, and as he was driving the last nail into the post, he felt a tug on his overalls, and he looked down and right into the eyes of a little boy. Mister, he said, I want to buy one of your puppies. Well, the farmer said, as he wiped the sweat off his brow, these puppies come from fine parents and cost a good deal of money. The boy dropped his head for a moment, and then reaching deep into his pocket, he pulled out a handful of change, and he held it up to the farmer, he said, I've got 39 cents. Is that enough to take a look? Sure, said the farmer. And with that, he gave out a whistle and said, Here, Dolly. Not from the doghouse ran Dolly, followed by four little balls of fur. And the boy pressed his face against the chain link fence and his eyes, of course, dancing with delight as he saw the little puppies. And as the dogs made their way to the fence, the little boys noticed something else stirring in the doghouse. Slowly another little ball appeared and this one was noticeably smaller. In a somewhat awkward manner, the little puppy began hobbling towards the others, doing its best to catch up. Clearly the run of the litter. I want that one, the boy said, pointing to the runt. Farmer knelt down at the boy's side and he said, son, you don't want that puppy. He'll never be able to run and play with you like these other dogs would. So with that, the little boy stepped back from the fence and he reached down and began rolling up the leg of his trousers. In doing so, he revealed a steel brace running down both sides of his leg and attaching itself to a shoe made for that purpose. Looked back up at the farmer and he said, you see, sir, I don't run too well myself and he'll need someone who understands. Are you someone who can understand? Someone who can empathize with others. People need someone who can understand. Next, Paul says, be of the same mind toward one another. In other words, live in harmony. Do not be haughty in mind. Don't be high-minded. Don't be conceited. But he says, associate with the lowly. Now that word lowly is not a derogatory word. It's just those who are in difficulty and trouble. And he says, do not be wise in your own estimation. I'm afraid that describes too far, far too many of us. Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. We need to place a high value on lowly things and bring our estimation of self into proper focus. A lot of us are like the little boy who came running to his mother shouting, Mother, I'm nine feet tall. His mother res responded, you know, don't, don't talk nonsense. But he said, I really am nine feet tall. I measured myself. Well, she asked him, how did you measure yourself? He said, well, I took off my shoe and measured with that. It's the same size as my foot. And I really am nine feet tall. With a smile, the mother replied, now I, now I understand. But I have to tell you that the measure, you know, your measure, your shoe wasn't right. It's not the right measure. We don't measure ourselves by the size of our own feet, but we use a 12-inch ruler to measure ourselves. A lot of us are like the little boy. We're, we're proud of something about which there really is no glory. Next, Paul says that we must never pay back evil to anyone. <coughs> this adds fuel to the fire and provokes violence when we pay back evil. Respect what's right in the sight of men, he says. In other words, do the honorable thing. Aim to be above reproach in the eyes of everybody. 
That kind of conduct will avoid many fights, many quarrels, many difficulties. Also, Paul says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. The other man may make it impossible, but a real desire for peace is a mighty safeguard against violence. Also, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Leave vengeance to God. He's a whole lot better at getting it than you are. Do you get the, the idea that Paul is saying, avoid, avoid a fight at all costs? Isn't that what he's saying? <laughs> at all costs, do not get into a fight. Christians can't properly avenge themselves. Only God can execute that which is just. You know, if, if you shoot somebody, you're probably going to be put in prison, even though they, done, they did something really horrible. A wise man once said, the most complete vengeance is not to imitate the aggressor. Paul quotes Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 in the next verse, and he tells us how we ought to respond. He says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And here's the reason why. For in so doing, you will heap coals upon his head. You'll give him a burning sense of shame. You'll be the better person by doing these things. In other words, don't over... Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Remember, God is conquering sin with grace. You know, he could thump all of us on the head for all of the sins we've committed, but no, he offers us grace. And we're to conquer evil actions towards us by returning good actions. But this is still the me generation, I'm afraid, that I grew up in, and it's even exceeded that. We're too quick to point out our own rights. But remember what the Lord's Prayer says? Remember how it goes? Forgive us our debts as we forgive what? Our debtors. Hmm. Is it our attitude? Is it really the attitude that we have? Should this be our attitude? It should. In John 13, 31 through 35, we find what Paul was describing in our text. And so let's read the whole section here. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will see me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Even though it was dark, you know, Jesus was getting ready for the cross. But even in that dark moment, he said to his disciples, this is the hour of glory. I'm going to be leaving, and where I'm going, you can't come right now. So in the meantime, I'm giving you this new commandment to love one another. A new commandment. Doesn't it say way back in Leviticus that we're to love God and that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves? Isn't that the message, really, of the scriptures in their entirety? It's what Jesus told us. That on these two commandments, to love God and to love people, hang all the prophets, all the law and the prophets. What does he mean here, a new commandment? Well, look carefully what Jesus is saying, because it's ra very radical. Yes, the Old Testament is filled with, with commandments and exhortations to love. But Jesus here makes everything new when he says, love one another. What's that next phrase? is I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love them? How does Jesus love us? You see, that's what's new. Paul tells us how Jesus 
loves us when he writes in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. The newness, the unfolding, the fullness of the new commandment is that we're to love in a way that costs us our lives. Not just loving generally, but loving sacrificially to the point of death. You see, biblically, there's, there, there's never true reconciliation apart from someone or something dying. In the Old Testament, reconciliation was possible only with sacrifice. So in other words, it's impossible without the sacrifice of the animal. In the New Testament, we see the Old Testament typology become reality with the death of the innocent Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. There will never be true reconciliation between you and the person with whom you're angry or from whom you're estranged until you say, I'm not going to grind my axe any longer. I'm not going to press my point any further. I'm not going to prove I'm right anymore. I'm just going to die and step out of the way. The question is, will you the next time that happens? But I'm innocent. I can hear people saying, it's not my fault. Wasn't Jesus innocent? But I lied. Was it Jesus right? The commandment he gave us is to die to our pride, to our complaints, to our position, to our proof. Well, what if I die? Does laying down my life and giving up my rights guarantee reconciliation? Well, was everyone reconciled to Jesus? No, they weren't. Not everyone is born again. Not everyone says, thank you, Lord, for laying down your life for me. When you love like Jesus, some will respond and there will be some reconciliation and others won't. Others, however, will continue to spit and curse and mock even if they did, you know, even like they did to Jesus as he was in the very act of dying for their sins. But if we're to love as Jesus loved, to love like him, we'll pray, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. And by this kind of love shall all men know you are my disciples, Jesus told us. When you love like I do, when you love even to the point of death, Jesus said a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That kind of love is a truly blazing love, a vibrant, effective love, some of us may need to pray and confess that we haven't been exercising that love as we ought towards our fellow believers, towards the lost, towards our neighbor, our family. Maybe you'll need to go to someone, even today. But we're going to sing that song, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Let's commit to be like that, to be people of love. I'm going to ask you to stand together with me as we sing. If you need to make a decision, I'll be up front. If you need to just come and pray, the altar's open to you. Let's commit to the Lord as we sing.